Hölgyeim és Uraim, remélem Önök is izgulnak. Nagyon sokat készültünk erre a mai ötös előadásra. Tekintettel, hogy ez az előadás sorozat egy intellektuális találkozó, ez, ez szerénység dukál, úgyhogy egyetlen egy embert szeretnék egyenlőre külön köszönteni, ez pedig Gulyás Gergely, a miniszterelnökséget vezető miniszter. Köszönöm, hogy itt van. Hölgyem és Uraim, köszönöm, hogy elfogadták a meghívásunkat. Ha igaz, hogy a tudás előfeltétele a kíváncsiság, akkor önök velem együtt megtettük az első legfontosabb lépést, eljöttünk ide, hogy szert tegyünk némi tudásra. Az ötvös előadások célja mindenkor, hogy egy adott és nagy súlyjal rendelkező témában a legjáratosabb, leginkább lényeglátó, a végeredményt tekintve leghitelesebb gondolkodók, elemzők és értelmezők segítségével ismerhessük meg változó világunkat. Nem mindegy ugyanis, hogy mennyit és mit tudunk erről a világról, hiszen ennek a tudásnak a mennyisége és minősége határozza meg gondolkodásunkat. Szóval örülök, hogy elfogadták meghívásunkat, és biztos vagyok benne, hogy mai vendégünk, Steve Bannon, Segít bennünket abban, ami ötvös József hitvallása szerint is az egyik legnemesebb törekvés. Idézem, meghaladni régi berögzöttségeinket és felújítani az időt álló eszmék erejét. Szóval köszöntöm Önöket, Tallai Gábor vagyok, a Terrorháza Múzeum programigazgatója. Egy szó, mint száz, 2018. május 23-a újra csak egy jeles nap a 21. század intézet, és a Polgári Magyarországért Alapítvány életében. 2015 óta ez lesz a negyedik alkalom, hogy ötvös előadást szervezünk itt a Várkert Bazárban, hogy közösen elemezzük, értékeljük a világ folyamatait, jelenségeit. Első előadónk 2015-ben Francesco Sisi volt, ő Kínáról beszélt, talán van önök közül olyan, aki akkor itt volt, és az sem kizárt, hogy valaki elolvasta azt a könyvet, amit Kínáról írt, és amit magyarul a mi közalapítványunk publikált. 70 oldalas könyvről van szó. Tehát aki 70 oldalban össze tudja foglalni, ami fontos Kínáról, az nagy tudás. Úgyhogy nagyon hálások voltunk érte. Ezt követően tartottunk ötös előadást, amelyen Erdő Péter és Balogh Zoltán, akkori miniszter, az emberi erőforrások minisztere, beszéltek a kereszténység 21. századi lehetőségeiről és jövőjéről, és aztán az elmúlt évben Frank Füredi, szociológus, akiről csak annyit, hogy a szociológián belül az övé a világ egyik legnagyobb impact faktora, akik értik ezt az egyetem világában, tudják, hogy ez mit jelent, hát ő tartott egy előadást, keresztes háború a kereszténység ellen, ez volt a címe, és parádis előadásnak örventünk akkor is. Mielőtt átadom a szót Gulyás Gergelynek, a miniszterelnökséget vezető miniszternek, aki egyébként az előadás sorozatot életre hívó két intézmény nevében a féle kontextus teremtő köszöntőt mond, kérem, tekintsenek meg egy rövid filmbejátszást ennek az előadás sorozatnak a névadójáról, Ötvös Józsefről. Ötvös József Báró 1813-ban született, és 1871-ben halt meg. Sokoldalú ember volt. Irodalmi munkássága épp úgy jellemezte, mint állambölcseleti tevékenysége. Kétszer is Magyarország vallás és közoktatásügyi minisztere lett. Először akkor, amikor 1848-ban létrejött a magyar történelem első felelős kormányzata. Másodszor akkor, amikor 1867-ben a magyar nemzet és a Habsburgok között létrejött a kiegyezés, aminek eredményeképpen a Habsburg birodalom átalakult osztrák-magyar monarchiává. Ötvöst azonban Magyarországon nem csak azért tisztelik, mert fontos állami pozíciókat töltött be. Politikus volt, de valójában politikájának eszmei tartalma és értelmiségi teljesítménye biztosítja számára a helyet a képzeletbeli nemzeti panteumban. Liberális volt. A társadalomra úgy tekintett, mint amelyet egyaránt jellemez az apály és a dagály játéka. 
ahogy fogalmazott, a legnagyobb lelkesülés és levertség időszakai szintói rendesen követik egymást. Ötös úgy gondolta, hogy az államot, az állam rendjét ennek megfelelően kell elrendezni. Olyan alapokat, szerkezetet kell teremteni, amely kiállja az apály és a dagály változásainak próbáját. Ő is megtalálta azt az eszközt, amelyet kortársai közül sokan erre a legalkalmasabbnak ítéltek, a szabadságot. Államszervezői és állambölcseleti munkásságát ez a felismerés hatotta át. Úgy látta, hogy a 19. század főeszméi a szabadság, az egyenlőség és a nemzeti eszme. Tevékenysége arra irányult, hogy ezek között a következményeiket tekintve nagyon is széttartó eszmék között valami fajta egyensúly alakuljon ki. Látta, hogy a nemzeti eszme egyeduralomba törekszik, de egy olyan sok nemzetiségű birodalomban élt, amelyik ezt az egyeduralmat nem viselte volna el. Tudta, hogy az egyenlőség ideája előbb-utóbb szétverheti a szabadság rendszerét hiszen a szabadság világában megteremtődik az az egyenlőtlenség, amelynek ellenhatásaképpen az egyenlőség eszme képes lehet lerombolni a szabadságot. Mindezek ellenszeréül mélyen hitt a politikai és személyi szabadság értékeiben. Úgy gondolta, hogy a személyes szabadság képes ellensúlyozni a nemzeti elvakultságot, és a politikai szabadság képes kanalizálni az egyenlőtlenségekből előálló feszültségeket. Éppen ezért hitt a parlamentális rendszerben és erre épülő központi hatalomban és a személyes szabadságjogokban. Úgy gondolta, hogy a szabadságnak nem csak politikai, hanem kulturális biztosítékot is kell adni. Vallotta, a szabadság biztosíték a műveltség. Miniszterségei alatt ezért munkálkodott az oktatási rendszer társadalmi kiterjesztésében, és ezért vallotta a tanszabadság ideáját. Ötvös egy olyan korban élt, amelyben a liberális állambölcselet nagy gondolkodói is éltek. Kortársa volt John Stuart Millnek és Alexis de tocqueville Az ő nevüket a világon minden művelt ember ismeri. Ötvös jelentőségét azonban jóval kevesebben észlelik, pedig Ötvös nem más, mint a közép-európai Tocqueville. Megérdemli az utókor tiszteletét, a szabadság barátainak szeretetét. Nos, hát látják, gazdagok vagyunk, szellemben, kultúrában, és felkérem Gulyás Gergelyt, köszöntse vendégünket, és indítsa el az előadást. Tisztelt főigazgatóasszony, tisztelt Hölgyeim és Uraim, tisztelt Benon úr, Isten hozta Magyarországon. 2016. november 8-án New Yorkban követhettem nyomon az amerikai elnök választás napját, Donald Trump elnök győzelmét. Hajnalban, amikor már teljesen egyértelmű volt a választás kimenetele és Clinton veresége, a médiumok egy része már megválasztott elnökként beszélt Trumpról, csak az úgynevezett független újságírás etalonjaként számon tartott CNN nem volt hajlandó szembesülni a választás eredményével. Így fordulhatott elő az a példátlan eset, hogy Hillary Clinton előbb ismerte be a vereségét és gratulált Donald Trumpnak, mint ahogy a CNN tudomásul vette volna a választók döntését. Ez is jól jelzi azt az álszentséget és cinizmust, amelyel a mainstream baloldali elit a demokráciára tekint. Rendkívül korai, akár csak megkísérelni is bármilyen ítéletet mondani Donald Trump elnökségéről, de az nyilvánvalóan az ő történelmi teljesítménye, hogy Hillary Clinton nem lett az Egyesült Államok elnöke. Steve Bannon, akkor Trump kampánytanácsadója mondta egy interjúban, hogy Amerikában a média a valódi ellenzéki párt, nem a demokrata párt, de a média elhibázott politikát vitt, mert nem érti saját országát, ezért még mindig nem értik, miért nyerhetett a republikánusok jelöltje. Alig két hónapja, április 8-án ugyanezt tapasztalhattuk itt Magyarországon is. A baloldali média vált a legnagyobb és leghangosabb ellenzéki erővé, elhibázott stratégiája azonban nem a kormány, 
hanem az ellenzék leváltásához vezetett. Ez csak egyike azon közelmúltbeli közös politikai tapasztalatoknak, amelyek megágyaznak a mai együtt gondolkodáshoz. Gondolhat bárki bármi Trump elnökről, mi érdeklődve tekintünk mindarra, amelyet Steve Bannonnal együtt értek el, de az biztos, hogy a 2016-os elnökválasztáson elért győzelem örökre az egyetemes politika történet része marad. Történelmi győzelem egy olyan legújabb kori, a nyugati világban végbevenő mozgalom történetében, amelyet Bannon úgy hív nemzeti populizmus. Azonban, ami Amerikában megengedett, Európában kerülendő kifejezés. Félreértésekre adhat okot, ezért én most itt egyszerűen inkább úgy hívnám ezt a folyamatot, hogy hogyan lehet visszaadni a döntés jogát az embereknek, és ezzel egyidejűleg előtérbe helyezni a nemzeti érdeket. Lényegében erről szól ez a folyamat, amely nagyon közel áll a magyar kormány politikájához, ahhoz, ahogy a minket körülvevő világot értelmezzük. Lehetne hosszas eszmehuttatásokat folytatni erről a jelenségről, de a mögöttes elképzelés végtelenül egyszerű. A nyugati civilizációt jellemző, több évszázados, az utóbbi évtizedekben a mainstream globalista erők előretörésének eredményeként a politikai korrektség gondolkodás bénító békjójába került demokratikus intézményrendszert le kell porolni és fel kell szabadítani. Amerika a szabadság hazája, ezért mindig nagy vonzerőt gyakorolt ránk magyarokra. Azért lettünk 1999-ben a rendszerváltozás utáni egyik nagy célkitűzés beteljesüléseként a NATO tagjai, mert a szabad világ részesei akartunk lenni. A szabad világé, amelyben egyszerre érvényesülnek egyéni és közösségi jogaink. Így volt ez az Európai Unió esetében is, amely a szocializmus után egyszerre kínálta a gazdasági felemelkedés és a nemzetek közötti egyenrangú együttműködés lehetőségét. Az illúziónk, amennyire egyáltalán illúzió lehetett mindez 1956 ismeretében, mostanra a realitás megismerésévé vált. Ugyanakkor hiszünk abban, hogy a szabad nemzetek igenis dolgozhatnak együtt szövetségben. Helmut Kohl írja politikai végrendeletében idézem, a bizalomra épülő együttműködéshez megbízhatóságra és kiszámíthatóságra van szükség és a megbízhatósághoz és a kiszámíthatósághoz az is hozzátartozik, hogy az ember felismeri a saját létfontosságú érdekeit, nem radikálisan és rövidlátóan, hanem becsületesen és egészen magától értetődően, fennhéjázás nélkül, előrelátóan, beágyazva a nagy egészbe, és tekintettel a közös érdekhelyzetre, valamint a többiek érzékenységére és érdekeire. Tisztelt Hölgyeim és Uraim! A szabadság közösségi műfaj, vagy ahogy Margaret Thatcher fogalmazott, a szabadság erkölcsi minőség. A szabadság mindig csak ott lehet, ahol egyén és közösség viszonya kölcsönös. A nemzet nem csak a közösen megszervezett életről és kultúráról, hanem a múlt és jelen mellett a jövőről is szól. Látjuk az élő amerikai közösségek által mutatott példát, ahol a maga képmutatástól mentes egyszerűségében fontos a család, a kereszt, a templom és a zászló. Azt tapasztaljuk, hogy a szabadság napjainkban komoly veszélyben van. A globalizáció és az azt mozgató üzleti érdek hadat üzent a közösségnek. Ez mindenek előtt kultúrharcot, mégpedig kőkemény kultúrharcot jelent. Bár nem hagyományos formában, nem két kultúra csap össze, hanem a szabad világ értékei állnak szemben a dekonstrukcióval. Tisztelt Hölgyeim és Uraim! Van-e esélye a lokálisnak a globálissal szemben? Ez korunk egyik nagy kérdése. Ez attól is függ, hogy mi történik a szabadság hazájában. Amerikában egy politikai forradalom után vagyunk. A lokális közösségek értékeit és érdekeit megjelenítő politikai közösség szerveződik, és egyre nagyobb sikerrel száll szembe a globalizmus érdekeit vele szemben érvényesteni szándékozó establishmenttel. Trump elnök választási győzelme, menetelése a republikánus párton belül, majd az, ahogy kiütötte a politikában hosszú évtizedeket eltöltött Hillary clinton mindenki számára váratlan nagy siker volt. Az az ember, akit ma este vendégünként köszönhetünk, elkötelezett híve a szólásszabadságnak, a véleménynyilvánítási szabadságnak, melyet az utóbbi időben a politikailag korrekt beszédmóddal igyekeztek kiszorítani a közbeszéd szinteréről. A sajtó területén végzett munkája egy újabb bizonyíték arra, hogy a nyilvánosságot, 
a szólás szabadságát nem lehet és nem is érdemes monopolizálni. Különösen így van ez, ha vannak bátor emberek, akik időről időre kimondják az igazságot, és nem mellesleg tudják, hogy ma ezen a pályán milyen formában és milyen eszközökkel kell harcolni. Benon úr, nagy szeretettel köszöntjük Magyarországon. Úgy érezzük, vannak olyan közös pontok, amelyek az Egyesült Államok és Európa közötti vitákban még nézeteltérések esetén is segíthetik a kölcsönös megértést. A hagyomány és az európai zsidó-keresztjén kultúránk tisztelete és védelme, a munkaalapú társadalom, a nemzeti érdek, biztonságunk és identitásunk megvédése mind ilyen közös értékek. És főleg elkötelezettségünk a nemzet, a szabadság és az igazság iránt mert hazugságban élni lehet, de alig, ha érdemes. Köszönöm a figyelmet! Nagy szeretettel köszöntjük Stephen Kevin Bannont itt Budapesten. Egy idézetet szeretnék felolvasni. Steve Bannon az utóbbi évek egyik legsikeresebb politikai innovátora, és nem mellesleg a média által épített hazugság fal lebontásának kikísérletezője. Schmidt Mária professzor asszony jellemezte legutóbb így módon előadónkat. Steve Bannon az amerikai elnök korábbi főstratégája, a Trump kampány vezetője volt. Azon ritka kortársak egyike, aki egyszerre része a világban zajló folyamatokról szóló intellektuális küzdelmeknek, miközben életpályája révén pontosan megtapasztalta a valóság, a reálpolitika józanító keretrendszerét. Nagy kincs ez. A nagy sikerű Breitbart News korábbi ügyvezető elnöke, annak előtte bankárként, befektetési bankárként dolgozott a Goldman Sachs-nél. Steve Bannon a Nemzetbiztonsági Tanulmányok szakon szerzett MA diplomát a Georgetowni Egyetemen, valamint MBA diplomát a Harvard Business Schoolon. Bannon az amerikai hadseregben szolgált tengerésztisztként, a Paul F. Foster fedélzetén a Csendes óceán nyugati részén, az Arab tengeren és a Perzsa öbölben. Ha valakire illik Konfúcius idézete, hát ő az, idézem, aki a célt ismeri, az tud dönteni. Aki döntött, nyugalmat talál. Aki megtalálta a nyugalmát, bizonyosságban él. Aki bizonyosságban él, az birtokolja önmagát. Aki birtokolja önmagát, az jobbá teheti életét. Arra kérem önöket, hallgassák meg előadását itt Budapesten, nem szeretnénk, hogyha felvételeket, fotókat készítenének, és arra kérem önöket, tartsák ezt tiszteletben. Ennek az előadásnak professzionális felvétel el fog készülni, és úgy gondolom, ezzel megtiszteljük vendégünket is, hogy adj velünkre, bízzuk azt, ami itt történik, meghallgatjuk és emlékezünk rá. Köszöntem tehát Budapesten Stephen Cannon, Kevin Bennont, akinek előadásának címe Trump, Amerika az első politikája és annak hatása Közép-Európára. Steve Bannon kérem a színpadra. I'm so proud to see you here. Thank you. I want to go back to the um The most important speech that President Trump gave in the first year of his presidency, July uh, 6th, 2017, Kaczynski Square in uh, Warsaw, Visegrad country, talked about the commitment of the will. And I quote, the fundamental question of our time is whether the West has the will to survive. Do we have the confidence in our values to defend them at any cost? Do we have enough respect for our citizens to protect our borders? Do we have the desire and the courage to preserve our civilization in the face of those who would subvert it and destroy it? 
Eight months later, the people of Hungary gave us an answer, overwhelming victory for Viktor Orban. And on May 4th, about a month after that victory, in a radio interview, Viktor Orban said, the main task of our new government would be to preserve Hungary, Hungary's security and its Christian culture. We are working on building an old school Christian democracy rooted in the European tradition. We believe in the importance of the nation and in Hungary, and we do not want to yield ground to any supranational business or political entity. Now tonight in uh, London, there's going to be an interview I gave last night uh, to BBC, BBC being the, uh, one of the lead parts of the opposition party propaganda machine, right? The Financial Times of London, the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, the Washington Post, CNN, BBC. We really don't have a political opposition today. We have a, a media opposition. Last question in the interview, and the interviewer was very fair. She asked very, very tough and pointed questions, but the, we, we had to extend it, had to keep extending it. The very last, she had to get in one last question. Last question is about Hungary, and Viktor Orban, and her head blew up, saying he said he was going to defend a Christian nation. Does this mean the end of liberal democracy? I said, come on. You know, liberal democracy worked for them fine for the 40 or 50 years they were winning elections, right? All of a sudden, when they start losing, we're all fascist. We're all authoritarians. We're all, you know, many dictators. Let's go back to, um, to August of 2016 when I left Breitbart and came into the campaign. President Trump had done a tremendous job in the, uh, in the uh, primaries. He had the convention, the uh, campaign got a little off track. He was down, you know, it was 88 days ago, I think down 16 points, double digits down in every battleground state. Not a lot of organization, not a lot of money. I talked to him that night when I came in as CEO. Kellyanne Conway came as campaign manager. And I said, to, to forget all those numbers. Those numbers are not, you know, being 16 down with 88 days ago, it's not relevant. Don't worry about it. He says only two numbers account said two-thirds, one-third. Two-thirds of the American people, the right track, wrong track, if you follow politics, two-thirds of the American people still think we're on, the, we're on the wrong track. They like President Obama personally, but they do not believe President Obama delivered the change that the country needs. I said, more importantly, Pat Cadell, the old Democratic pollster, has been doing work on this for years. 75% of the American people, for the first time in Pat Cadell's polling, 75% believed America was in decline. And we looked at the cross tabs. The working class and the middle class in the United States of America are not prepared to support that. The elites are fine with it. They have a problem with the rise of China. They don't have the problem with the decline of America. They call it the Thucydides trap. They got some fancy title from ancient Greece. They kind of... Uh, cover themselves under because they're going to make just as much money on the way down as they made on the way up. But the backbone of our society, the backbone of the United States of America, it's working class, black, Hispanic, white, in the middle class, particularly the lower middle class, they will follow a leader who will return America to her former greatness, her former glory. And they will support someone who will make America great again. I told President Trump to 100% metaphysical certitude. You follow this plan and you'll win. You'll beat her. Now how the fuse that, that lit the Trump revolution started about, I don't know, nine years before. That the 10th anniversary of it is going to be this September. Back in September 2008, at about 9 o'clock in the morning, I think it was September 15th, I think the exact date was, 2008, 9 o'clock in the morning, the city of London, 
Lehman Brothers, the uh, British subsidiary of it's kicked into bankruptcy. And all the geniuses, all these smart guys, you know, you see them on TV, they're studying London hedge fund, you, um, they're on CNBC and CNN, you know, they're so brilliant, they're so smart. You know, Goldman Sachs, McKinsey, Bain, you know, Deutsche Bank, they're all, they're all brilliant, right? They're smart. Smartest guys in the room. They forgot one thing. Oops, Lehman Brothers is the center of the commercial paper market. The entire financial system of the globe started to implode. Three days later, Ben Bernanke and Hank Paulson, Hank, the former chairman and CEO of Goldman Sachs, is a very junior banker. You know, I was a bag carrier for Hank in his Goldman Sachs days. I knew one thing about Hank, math was not a strong point. <laughs> they go into President Bush over at the Oval Office and they say, we need one trillion dollars of cash money. That's the good news. <laughs> the bad news is we need it by five o'clock. <laughs> they got people running around, they don't know it's in the Constitution. So that, you know what they do? It's a, a, a real profile and courage. They send them up to Capitol Hill. And in Capitol Hill, they made them put their blackberries, made them put their blackberries outside because so, this, is, this is like DEFCON 1. And they go in there and they tell them we need a trillion dollars by the end of the day. And they've got the House you know, uh, Banking Committee and the Senate Banking Committee and Nancy Pelosi's there. She's a speaker. And they, uh, and they tell them, um, and they said, well, look, we just can't create a trillion dollars and give it to you. What, what, what is this about? And they said, if we don't have a trillion dollars, in 72 hours, the American financial system is going to melt to the ground. And in six days, the world financial system will collapse. We had done to ourselves, you know, Wall Street and the city of London and the guys in Frankfurt and all these smart guys. We had done to ourselves what, you know, Kaiser Wilhelm couldn't do and, 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 uh, and the military junta in Japan and Mussolini and Hitler and the Bolsheviks and Mao Zedong and even uh, Osama bin Laden. The biggest enemies of the West, people that hated us to our core, couldn't do what we did ourselves. They told them right there, when the world financial system melts down, it's going to be global anarchy. In fact, congressmen later who were criticized by the constituents for voting for these bailouts were saying, how could I do anything else? I had the Secretary of Treasury and the head of the Federal Reserve telling me there was going to be global chaos. Now, the elites, all these, uh, all these smart guys as represented by Hillary Clinton, and remember, when we run it against Clinton on that August day, I said, all we have to do is very simple. We're going to hold her up as the guardian of a corrupt and incompetent elite. And all you have to do is be a tribune of the people, a populist nationalist movement. And we get permission, when people give you permission, when you get permission for people to vote for you, besides all your personal foibles, you're going to win and you're going to win big. Corrupt and incompetent. You know how we, we saved ourselves from financial disaster? We did save ourselves from financial disaster. Yeah, we did. The Great Depression that, you know, we haven't totally solved it. That's all coming, okay? The balance sheet of the Federal Reserve on that day was $880 billion. Balance sheet of the Federal Reserve today is $4.5 trillion. The Bank of Japan and the ECB are still negative interest rates. You know all that is? That's all fancy talk for the elites bailed themselves out. They just created money, inflated the assets. If you owned real estate or intellectual property or stocks in the last 10 years, you've had the greatest run in human history. But if you're working stiff, you haven't had a raise since 1970. Here's the cruel thing about this. Here's the cruel thing about this, is that it's the working guy, man and woman, who paid for it? It's their taxes that bailed them out. We have concentration of wealth in the United States that boggles the mind. I'm a capitalist. 
You know, you know the United States and the EU and Japan, you know what they need? They need a dose of capitalism. Because right now we have socialism for the very poor and we have socialism for the very wealthy. We, we've totally socialized the rich. They have no downside. Anything screws up, they're going to bail themselves out. Heck, they were in, they were in uh, that weekend... I think it was Thursday they went up to see Bush. That weekend, they were all in, you know, Sullivan and Cromwell, all these guys in like 50 conference rooms around Goldman Sachs and GE Capital. They're all prepared to go bankrupt. But Monday morning, Goldman Sachs went in, signed a one-line piece of paper, made themselves a bank holding company, approved by the Federal Reserve. And Hank Paulson, Secretary of Treasury, bank holding company, they could borrow at zero, lend out at a couple hundred basis points, you know, make $5, $10 billion a year just by opening the, you know, cutting the lights on. Did the average person get a bailout like that? The average working person in Hungary, the United States, did they get to be a, uh, a bank holding company? No. The elites are the greediest, most incompetent group that's ever had control of a society. I want to thank my agent out there for... Keep doing that, I'll get better paid speeches. <laughs> that's, that's, what, that's the fuse that lit the Trump revolution. 2010, the Tea Party, the rise of the Tea Party. Off your elections, if you follow the United States, 62 seats with a group that had no money. A real populist revolt. Republican Party didn't know how to handle it. 62 seats. Viktor Orban voted back into power in Hungary. 2012, the Republicans abandoned the populist movement. Mitt Romney thinks he's going to do it his own, gets beat by Barack Obama, should have beat him. Guy had the worst numbers ever in a reelect, got beaten. What, 2000, uh, 2014, another big surge in the Republican Party with the populist movement, won a bunch, a bunch more seats. In the spring of 2014, Nigel Farage and UKIP stun everybody in the parliamentary, uh, European parliamentary elections. In 2015, Donald Trump is at the top of the stairs in Trump Tower, comes down to announce for the presidency. He's in seventh place. People think it's a joke. Donald Trump's a clown. Donald Trump this. Donald Trump's just doing this to get a better deal on the apprentice, get the, the ratings up. He comes down, he gives a speech about trade, unfair trade deals, working class, talks about the border, you know, mentions rapes. The, 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 the left-wing media goes crazy. Donald Trump by that evening is in first place, never looked back. In August of 2015, the second big blow, Angela Merkel decides unilaterally to, you know, let in a couple of million folks here to Europe, almost destroys Europe, the European Union, single-handedly. And then in 2016, Brexit, and then the Trump victory. Got one thing about Brexit is important. You mentioned CNN in the introduction. You know, the geniuses at CNN, the, the guys that know all about the, all about the, all about the world. On the night that Farage, Farage won, and by the way, you know, Farage conceded, Nigel conceded early in the evening. We had to call him up. He'd had a couple of beers. We said, Nigel, not so fast. <laughs> the, the, the Midlands, you know, the labor vote hasn't come in. I think, I think it's going to be better than you think. So he kind of walked that back, and it did. Because the working class in England knew what the story was. CNN's putting on guys that night that called it like Nigel Farage. had no earthy idea. They were completely gobsmacked. They had absolutely clueless that this was going to come on. That was a forerunner to 2016. Once you saw Brexit, because Brexit and 2016 are inextricably linked, this global revolt. What links them is the exportation of Chinese deflation, and overcapacity. Now, it kind of comes to Europe a little more circuitous than it does the United States. But the suppression of working class jobs, working class wages, and the fact that the elites don't care because the elites have made plenty of money on shipping jobs to China. Remember, there's a logic to this. It's not the second law of physics, but there's an industrial logic. If you own intellectual property, if you own assets, if you own control of companies, if you own the ability to, to, to order products made, if you, order, if you own equity, 
it's absolutely logical if you have no barriers to send the production over to the cheapest place possible and produce it. Doesn't mean it's right, doesn't mean it's going to help civil society. That's the one thing that's been missing. If you, if you read this book, Hillbilly Elegies by J.D. Vance, who's the great sociologist that studies the Trump movement in Ohio, one of our industrial states. He cites MIT and Harvard studies. There's a direct correlation, a direct correlation between the factories that moved to China, the jobs and billets that went with them, and the opioid crisis. When we talk about terrorists, we talk about bringing these jobs back. It's just not about the economics of these jobs. And I'm a capitalist. I understand you got to do it at a certain operating margin. But it's more than that. It's about civic society. It's about the underpinnings of your culture, the working class, the people that Hillary Clinton really summed it up. She summed it up best on September 10th, a high holy day in the Trump movement. Hillary Clinton goes to Wall Street. I mean, if you wrote a script on this, they'd throw you out of the, the room and you pitched it because it's too unbelievable. She goes to Wall Street for a fundraiser that she's going to raise $5 million on. She is introducing Barbara Streisand. No, Babs, one of the most obnoxious people in the world, to sing. And on her, on her, on her, on her, this is a written script. This is not off the top of the head. This is a written script. She says that 50%, half of the Trump supporters are deplorables. And then half of them are irredeemable. You just do the math, it's 30 million people. It's the audience response that's important if you watch the video. They're hooting and hollering and clapping and yeah, they're dancing around, yep. They detest working class people. They despise working class people. You have to embrace that. There's no middle ground here. They hold the working class in complete and total contempt. You know, Donald Trump has triggered something in our country that's, that's very deep. He's triggered the party of Davos global elite the scientific, managerial, engineering, financial elite, and all their apparatchiks understand that the game could be up. And they hate him for it. It's pure, raw hatred. You know, after we won, and, and we kind of knew we won by, you know, they didn't call it until 2.30 in the morning. It was a great example here of the CNN you know, holding out, didn't want Trump to, you know, want Trump to give his victory speech at four in the morning, right? Um, Hillary did not give her concession speech that night. She had a few too many cocktails earlier. <laughs> we knew we won it when uh, the Detroit Free Press reversed the call in Michigan and said it was uh, too close to call. They had called it for Hillary at eight o'clock in the evening and reversed it at about 11. And here's the reason, the algorithms were wrong. All these exit, when we saw the exit polls at five o'clock, my 100% metaphysical certitude that I had told him in August and then reaffirmed on Billy Bush weekend when everybody wanted to quit or you know, go on TV and apologize, I said, let's just go have a rally, right? Because people don't care. What they care about is to take their country back. What they care about is saving their communities. What they care about is the defense of Western civilization. They may not articulate it that way, but that's what MAGA means. But with, um, with Clinton, you could see the personification of that globalist elite. And you can see it in the mocking and ridiculing of what Donald Trump's done since then. They, ha they can't embrace the fact that they lost and they've lost touch with their real base, which is the working class, and they've gone to this identity politics. Remember, when I was announced, he was so far behind on that Monday uh, Clinton came out, she was on the beach, she was in Hamptons and in the Upper East Side, all these high net worth places raising money. She wouldn't even campaign it. She came back to make a speech. Her first speech, I think, in three weeks. 
and I'm sitting in the I'm sitting in the war room. We got TVs all up in the monitor. We got all these young people there. The rapper responding. I kind of go in there. She's going to do this big speech, and the cry runs running, because they say, "Oh, Bannon, he's so far behind. All he wants to do is destroy his enemies. He can't win. Biggest landslide in history. He's going to he's going to take guys down as he goes down. And he's got the mad bomber from Breitbart's going to do it for him, right? And I look at the screen, and she's got alt right, white supremacists. Um, you know, um, uh, misogynist, every other name of the book. And I sat there with the young folks, and I said, if she's going to run on identity politics and we're going to run on economic nationalism, this thing's over. This is not even going to be close. There will be 300 electoral votes or more because people don't care about that. The elites and the people hanging out in the Hamptons, the Upper East Side, in the Green Room at CNN, that's what they care about. The BBC, that's last night. The poor reporter almost had a heart attack. She almost had a heart I couldn't believe it. I said, well, says, you know, he said he was going to defend a Christian nation. I said, it is Europe, isn't it? I said, calm down. It's not that bad. I can tell Viktor Orban triggers him like Trump. He was Trump before Trump. And he's got the scars to prove it. Look how vicious they've come after him. For what? Defending his country? Building a border? Save his people? Are these high crimes and misdemeanors? Is what he's done so terrible to, 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 for the vitriol that's been dumped on him, on Trump? Remember, they couldn't embrace the fact that they got beat, and they got beat badly. And I don't want to hear the popular vote versus the Electoral College. We have a system in the United States. We've had it since the very beginning. It's not about popular vote. If it was about popular vote, we would run a different campaign and we would have beaten her in the popular vote, okay? That's not the game. The game is the electoral vote. She had $2.2 billion. She had all the media. She had all these geniuses and computer programs, everything like that. You know, we had a plane and we had Donald Trump in a message. That's, that's what you need. Immediately, they had, to embrace the, uh, they had to embrace the Russia thing, right? Had to be Russia. Couldn't have been them. Couldn't have been their program. Couldn't have been that. Had to be Russia. Had to be Russia. In, in the mainstream media, the propaganda, I call it the opposition party. When I call it the opposition party, I wasn't kidding around. There's no Democrat party. If you talk about Trump's position on China, you, the people don't automatically go, oh, yeah, but the Democrats think this. If you think Trump's policy on destroying the physical caliphate of ISIS, you can't think, oh, yeah, but the Democrats are this. If you think of uh, Trump's policy about going after tariffs, you can't think there's no Democratic policy of this. The Democratic Party in the United States as a crutch uses the opposition party media. Cut the TV on. All the important things happening in the world today. You cut on CNN at prime time, and you're going to get 45 minutes of Russia and Michael Cohen and Stormy Daniels, right? Constantly, constantly, constantly. I don't mind it. They're setting themselves up for another defeat, right? They've used that as a crutch. You need reps. You've got to build muscle mass to win. The Democrats don't have it. They can't stand up there every day. They, they haven't thought it through yet. They're still talking about, you know, uh, uh, minimum wage. And, you know, Bernie Sanders' his big plan, minimum wage and universal health care. Hey, the 20th century called and wants its policies back. There hasn't been any original thinking in the Democratic Party. They don't have to. The media covers for them. But now you're seeing something different about this Russia thing. By the way, Bob Mueller's a good man. He's a combat Marine, honorable man. He's had a year. Take as much time as you want. Go for it. I saw the 44 questions they laid out. Didn't seem that tough to me. That's what he spent a year looking for. Those are what you want answered, right? Didn't look too tough. Remember, I'm the guy that argued you shouldn't fire Comey. You'll get a special prosecutor, but hey, you got it. You wanted to fire him, you fired him, you got a special prosecutor. Fine, take your time. But look at what we know now. What happened in Cambridge University? Who's this fella, Stefan Halper? You know, who paid for all that? Who authorized it? 
If you ever heard of the Church Commission in the United States of America, that was back in uh, when we had this issue with the CIA after the Vietnam War, it was back in the mid 70s. A senator named Church had a commission to review how the CIA operated. Write this down, folks. We're going to have a church commission not too far in the distant future. It's not the deep state. It's the in-your-face state. It's not shy about how it does it. The party of Davos and these global elites have a way they want to roll. And if you think because you win one election, and I don't care if it's in Hungary or the United States of America, the Czech Republic, or India. If you think they're going to sit there and go, man, that's refreshing. You guys won. Here are the keys. Just do what you want. No, that's not going to happen. Look at Brexit. Brexit tells you everything you want to know. Look at the slog they've had on trying to get out, where they come up with a new concept every day of why you can't do it. Look at Donald Trump. Look at the resistance on Trump. If it was on policy, I could understand it. You know, they mock and ridicule Trump every day. Let's take, let's take America first. All they say is isolationism, is isolationism, is isolationism. Isolationism? Are you kidding me? Right? In his inaugural address, in his inaugural address, he says, and I quote, we will rejuvenate old alliances and make new ones. And we will unite the civilized world to eradicate radical Islamic terrorism from the face of the earth. When President Trump wrote that down in Mar-a-Lago, a couple of the advisors we were working with him, he said, that's a pretty big check that they're going to make sure you cash. In one year, the destruction of the physical caliphate of ISIS Oh, yeah, 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 but somebody told me that. Yeah, but Obama was doing that. Will you give me a break? <laughs> Will you give me a break? They want to talk about facts. In 2014, ISIS had 8 million people under captivity. They had oil fields. They had wheat fields. They were taxing people. They're a more vibrant state than Iraq and Syria combined. Recruiting here in Europe and sending people back to kill folks. James Mattis said, General Mattis told the president when he took the job, this is not going to be a war of attrition. If you want them annihilated, I will annihilate it. And it wasn't pretty. Look at Mosul. Look at Raqqa. Look like Dresden. Right? America was engaged. America's not isolationist. America was there with allies, with folks up there doing the work. In the speech that I quoted from the beginning, at, at, at the... Um, the Visgrad, the Three Oceans Initiative. Before he gets to the defense of the West, he talks about the Riyadh Summit. You won't hear about the Riyadh Summit. Mainstream media, they want to talk about Stormy Daniels, right? They want to talk about Michael Cohen trying to, trying, to, um, trying to get some consulting business. In Riyadh, President Trump, you know, the Muslim ban and the travel, their heads are all blowing up. This is what the BBC, you know, reporter jumped me for. Oh, Muslim ban. I said, well, hang on for a second. In 90 days, we went to Riyadh. He talked to 54 Muslim nations all came together because they wanted him to come there and address them and work out a plan together. And there were three things that happened from there. Number one, and this is coming from them, radical Islamic terrorism is now a threat against their societies, not just exporting it to the West. And so number one is we're going to stop the games and we're going to stop financing it. And we don't care if it's Qatar or we don't care if it's members of the royal family or who it is, it's going to stop. Number two, coming off General Sisi's great speech in Cairo in 2013 and January 1st about how Islam has to go through its own modernity process. It has to have its own enlightenment. We in the West can't do that. The Muslim nations will do that. They can do that. We were there to support President Trump, that picture in the globe. He's sitting there with the king of Saudi Arabia and General Sisi. That's the new center for countering Islamic extremism. Funded, paid for, staffed by Muslim nations. Full support from the Judeo-Christian West. And number three, Persian expansion. The expeditionary capability of the Persians in Baghdad, in 
Damascus, in Lebanon, and now in, on, in Yemen. And to come up with a, with, a, with a potential solution for that, to start to work together with Egypt in Bahrain, in the UAE, in Saudi Arabia, Jordan, and eventually, hopefully, Israel. That's what the Iran deal is all about. Is that, is that sound like, does that sound like isolationism? You know, I don't mind if they criticize Trump, if they just spend the time and effort to do the work and argue on the merits of the case. What they want to protect, the globalist elite, the geniuses, the same geniuses in back in 2008, now the geniuses in the foreign policy that, you know, has had America spend $7 trillion, you know, Brown University, we spent $7 trillion on, the, on, the, on these wars, $7 trillion with no victory, right? We're still spending $50 billion a year in, 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 in Afghanistan, no victory in sight. What, 15,000 combat dead, 45,000 wounded, present value, I think, of a trillion dollars, seven trillion dollars from the geniuses. Here's what they want to protect. Post-war, you have this rules-based, international, liberal order. And that's a series of commercial relationships, capital markets, trade deals, and alliances, security alliances from Europe, Northwest Europe, Europe all the way through, Persian Gulf, South China Sea, Northwest Pacific. Loop all the way around. Donald Trump's the first time in history. He's a business guy. He's a real estate guy. He's an entrepreneur. He walks in there and he says, you've got to look at these things as a whole cloth. You have to look at the commercial part of it and the security part of it. We can't be upside down. We're upside down with the EU. We're upside down with the Persian Gulf. We're upside down in the littoral nations of the South China Sea. And we're really upside down in East Asia and in Korea and Japan. And we have to have a different, this has to be different. That's what America First is. He doesn't want to destroy that order, but he wants a different set of priorities. Where it, it is, America First is very simple, where it's in the vital national security interest of the United States of America. It will be in the vital national security interests of our local partners and allies. That's what it's about. You know, all, John McCain, everybody, they're all over here, you know, railing at us, these nationalists, these crazy nationalists. They want to withdraw from it. Not withdrawing. Look what we just did in Iran. Look at Pompeo's 12 points. What we're trying to do is link the obvious. You've got to link what Hezbollah's doing to their making of the bomb. Look in the South China Sea. Under Obama, the South China Sea, I used as a young sailor, we were in the South China Sea patrolling like a naval officer or a naval vessel supposed to patrol. Guns up, radars up. We've been doing safe passage there for years. The Chinese are scared the hell of us. They built seven stationary aircraft carriers. Look what Trump's done there. Northwest Pacific. The engagement of China and Korea, whether this thing happens on the 12th or not, is not relevant. For, you know, from Bush to Clinton to Bush and Obama, we were told by all the geniuses, oh, I'm not going to have any nuclear weapons. They'll agree to this, they'll agree to that, they'll agree to that. Hello. He's got 50 nuclear weapons. Ballistic missile capability to hit Osaka and Tokyo today and probably Portland and, you know, Los Angeles. Was that on Donald Trump's watch? Did Donald Trump cause that? But he came up with a solution, fully engaged. So America First does not be isolationist. What America First means is that we want allies who are going to be allies. And NATO is a big issue. Here's why. The EU is wealthy. It's the same size economy as the United States of America. Population, same size as the United States of America. It's the, it's the deplorables tax dollars and their kids that are funding this whole thing. It can't go on. Mom and Dad, there's a coffee reception afterwards. <laughs> Thank you. Now, here, here's, here's, here's why. Here's why. Here's why. The defense bill, it, it, it was $700 billion, and Trump raised it. All in, when you add it all up in real accounting of the, of the, of the, of the, uh, the intelligence and the homeland security and everything, all the odds and ends buried in other departments, it's a trillion dollars. It's one trillion dollars. One trillion dollars. Our deficit now in the United States in perpetuity is going to be a trillion dollars. Okay? It's bleeding us out. But more importantly, that's not the most important thing. Now, I'm a, I come from a blue-collar 
Democratic family. And I was a naval officer. My daughter is a graduate of the United States Military Academy at West Point. She served with the 101st Airborne in Iraq. She, she, the proudest thing I've got is on my mantle at the Breitbart Embassy is a picture of her with her weapon in her cami sitting on Saddam Hussein's throne. I can die a happy man. By the way, we're nothing extraordinary. We're just an average family. My kid brother's a Navy pilot. His wife's a Navy nurse. We're just, we're just an average, we're an average American blue-collar family. Serves their country. Not for careers. Serve for five, six, seven, eight years. Go, do, go to civilian life after that. But that's the deplorable. It's their kids in the Hindu Kush on patrol. It's their kids in the South China Sea. It's their kids are the 28,000 combat troops that are going to be the point of the negotiation about Korea is going to come down to those 28,000 folks and exactly where they're stationed, right? You all know that. America's four deployed all over the world. Heck, my daughter did that, that exercise two summers ago when he took the tanks, everything. I think it was from the Balkan states and came all the way down to Ukraine to the Czech Republic. Remember that? She's part of that. You know, what is a kid from uh, Southern California got in the Ukraine? Well, that's a question we're asking. We shouldn't have to go around and talk about partners about 2%. You're either in or you're out, right? You know, I was in the, I was in the military when, when, you know, I came off sea duty on a, on a destroyer that was built to hunt Soviet submarines, came off sea duty and, and came back to the Pentagon first day of the Reagan administration. The whole thing was about taking down the Soviet Union. You know, then we had these plans of tanks coming across the folded gap and all this stuff happening and, you know, deep warfare in the, in the Eastern Europe. You know, air, land, sea, battle, 2000, things like that. Threat, threat to Europe today, and this is why it's you all that got to partner with and get ready. If you think Syria almost took down the EU in the summer of 2015 and had another migrant crisis in Italy that brought a populist government to power in 2016, that's nothing. Right? General Sisi, the brave men and women in Egypt, they're trying to make this government work and that society work against the opposition of the Muslim Brotherhood, right? Being financed out of the Persian Gulf. If Egypt collapses, Europe's got a problem. Chinese right now, the Chinese right now are like the East India Company in Sub-Saharan Africa. Right? It's a business model we've seen before. The British did it down in India in, what, the 18th century? Fairly rapacious. They're building all that infrastructure. It's all debtor and possession lending, Right? They're lending them the money to build the infrastructure, bring in Chinese engineers, Chinese workers. You wait till they start walking north, because they're coming north, in North Africa. It's a ticking time bomb. That's a national security issue. The United States is, is, is prepared to be a partner, right? The deep roots of the defense, you know, Donald Trump did not go to Warsaw. How symbolic Warsaw is, and Poland is, and the Visegrad nations, to the legacy of Ronald Reagan and the great victory over the Soviet Union, he did not go there and give those words. Those speechwriters did not put the defense of the West in there just randomly. Outside of Ronald Reagan, what politician could have made that speech in the last 75 or 80 years in the United States? Right? It's the reason Victor Orban has their heads blown up at BBC. The global elites are not prepared to, are not prepared to see that. But America first, in the engagement of the United States, there has to be local allies. What the United States and the people of the United States and the, and the deplorables, what, what we don't want is a group of protectorates. That's what we have right now. By the way, that's the way the global elites like it. They don't like you to have the ability to defend yourselves or be an active partner. They've built, if you look at the United States military, it's quite different from when I was in it. They've built this humanitarian expeditionary force that they can send everywhere to be the global cop, right? To their rules-based order and to the way that they, the party of Davos runs things. That's the way they want it. They don't want Japan to be able to defend itself. They don't want Korea to be able to defend itself. They don't want Europe to be able to defend itself. 
They don't want active partners. They want this kind of imperialistic, you know, humanitarian do-goodism. And as long as they can spend the deplorables' money, and more importantly, as long as they can spend their kids' lives, they'll do it. You know, that's $7 trillion, and that, what, 15,000 dead and 40,000 wounded? Well, trust me. You know, I went to Harvard, and there ain't a lot of Harvard alumni in that group. These people are the worst people in the world. And I detest them as much as they detest the deplorables. We have a lot of work in front of us, a long road to hoe. You know, President Trump's speech and Viktor Orban's speech talked about survival of the West. Well, how about the thriving of the West? The Judeo-Christian West is one of mankind's greatest creations. Remember, we come from a cultural background that believes that we're created in the image and likeness of God and that our rights don't come from any government. Our rights don't come from anything that's man-made. Our rights don't come from any institution. They come directly from God to us. That's why the kids in China, and that's why the kids in Southeast Asia, and that's why kids in Sub-Saharan Africa, in the Middle East, that's why they want to come to Cambridge University and Oxford, the great universities here in Eastern Europe, into the United States. Oh, yeah, it's got the technical aspects of it, too. But underlying it, it's a deep cultural direction that draws people in. Remember, Burke, Edmund Burke, the conservative philosopher, said that uh, we owe as much to those who came behind us as we owe to future generations. We have a duty and an obligation to those from time immemorial that have handed this down to us. We're going to be judged, each one of you. You're going to be judged. You're going to be weighed and measured by how we did here. Hundred years from now, they're going to look back. There's an inflection point, no doubt about it. It's a long, tough road. Ask Victor Orban, ask Donald Trump. Look at the vitriol put on those guys. For what? They defended their country? They wanted to have borders? They wanted to have the rule of law? They believed in their cultures and their societies? That was a crime that this media, these pack of hyenas, can try to tear you apart every day? That's what you're up against. And that's how we're going to be measured. Now, I'd love a good fight. We've got a good fight in front of us. But I love the fact that folks like you are on our side of the football. Thank you very much. Steve, <laughs> thank you so much. Do, Let me ask you something. Yeah, we can do questions. We can, you know, yes, however you yes, want to do it. Yes, but I have a question to okay. you. Let me ask you. Uh, if Martin Heidegger has right, the language is the building of all. Hang on, and hang on, hang on. I got D in philosophy. <laughs> <laughs> you got to remember. And remember, you developed remember, a new language. I I know math. I don't know the philosophy is little. You developed a new language okay. in Breitbart News. A language of success, a language for winners. Tell us something about this process of developing a new language. Well, I think in, in, in Breitbart, it's just the fact that we created a platform. You know, this is, you're going to have to fight for this. They're just not, like I said, any one election. They're not going to sit there and toss you the keys. Particularly in the United States, we understand one thing, and I think... Here in Hungary, in the West, you understand it. In the United States, we are fighting for control of the most powerful nation in the history of mankind. Those are pretty high stakes. And people are not just going to give you control of that because you won an election. You can see with Donald Trump. From the very beginning, they've tried to delegitimize his presidency, saying, you know, Clapper's out today with his book saying, oh, it's, it's absolutely proven, absolutely proven that the Russians gave Donald Trump the election. 
you know what he based on? I had a guy re- get the book on Kindle last night, read it, because I said Clapper, you know, he's been DNI for six years, director of national intelligence, you know, runs all the things. You know what his thesis is? <laughs> I kid you not. It's the Facebook, it's these little Facebook ads. $100,000 a month. That's a pretty thin read to say that the Russians won. I mean, it's beyond a joke, right? But they'll do anything. So in Breitbart, it was very simple. We call ourselves the Fight Club, right? Oh. And we wanted to report the news in a, in, a, in a different way. And we're very proud of the fact of the fact that, you know, everybody says, oh, they're objective, they're objective, they're objective. Give me a break. The editorial page in the New York Times is the front page. The editorial page of the Times of London is the front page. And so we, we came at it as partisans. We're proud of being partisans and, that, and starting Breitbart London. And, and here's the great news about it is that Europe, the populist nationalist revolt, is about a year and a half or two years ahead of the United States. That's why studying Nigel Farage and UKIP, which is a more professional Tea Party, studying what's going on in Italy, studying what's going on in Hungary, right? You'll see much of what you guys talk about back into the campaigns in the United States because you guys just happen to be ahead of the cycle. So in Breitbart, I'm very proud of taking a little organization like that. Andrew was an uh, absolute legend. Uh, it, it, he understood particularly new media, better than anybody. And, uh, you know, before I went in the White House, we had these great plans of expanding into Europe. Uh, some, you know, some great expansion plans, but that kind of got, got sidetracked by my time in the, uh, in the campaign of the White House, so it's, uh, it hasn't happened. But hopefully one day it may happen. I think you need a platform like that over here, so. Okay, we have a long day after us. One last question. From your point of view, what is the effect of the new politic of the United States on our region? I think it, listen, President Trump did not, you know, in a year when he had the inaugural address, which laid out what he wanted to accomplish, which basically said, now comes the hour of action. He was finished with all the talk of the politicians. To then look at the Riyadh summit, right, in May, then in July, to Poland, to the Visegrad countries, to the three, you know, three oceans initiative, that was very important. You know, uh, my countrymen, the United States, we, we, we have followed Eastern Europe very closely. And here's one of the reasons is that it was the entire, you know, war with President Reagan against the Soviet Union. You know, President Reagan... You have to remember one thing, it's like this thing with China. China is going to be the most important geostrategic endeavor of our time in, in, in defending the Judeo-Christian West. It's going to come down to, you know, this, this great, um, I don't want to say conflict's the wrong word, competition. And you can see it lining up right now. China, Persia, and Turkey. China, Persia, and Turkey. The landmass of Asia. It's, it's, the, it's the one belt, one road, right? That's the most audacious geopolitical, it's Mackinder's theory of the control of the landmass of Asia, personified in highways and rail lines. At the same time, China does Mahan's theory of the ports in the Maldives, Sri Lanka, Djibouti, right? The, what the British Empire and then the Americans followed. So you can see this lining up right now with the Judeo-Christian West and the Sunni Arab nations united in opposition with India and the South Korea, Australia, the littoral countries of the South China Sea and Japan. What President Reagan saw, remember, Kissinger and the guys will tell you today that this, the Thucydides trap that the West is in decline and that China's on the rise and that their solution, you know, they, they work out this theory 16 times in world history. It's it's led to the catastrophic, 16 times it's happened, 12 times it's led to catastrophic war, like in the Pel- Peloponnesian War, Sparta versus Athens. But four times the wisdom of the declining power led it that the declining power could push the rising power into a better zone and both lived happily ever after, okay? Kissinger, by the way, had the same rap on the Soviet Union. Remember when Ronald Reagan came to office, it was Kissinger that called him the most dangerous man in the United States. Because Kissinger had the same theory about the Soviet Union, that they were 
a, a rising power. We were a declining power. One, one problem with that. When Reagan came to office, Bill Casey came from Wall Street to head the CIA, and he went through the math. He says, hey, I think we have a problem here. The problem was they had miscalculated the size of the economy of the Soviet Union. Remember that? In the first year of the Reagan administration, they went back and recalculated. The Soviet economy was 50% less. That means their defense expenditures were almost half of their economy. They couldn't go on. The Reagan defense bill with the 600-ship Navy and Star Wars, all of it was economic warfare to bury them. And guess what? The CIE still said it'll take 40 or 50 years to do it. We can do it economically now because they can't keep up. Eight years later, it's over. You know, I realize that you guys have a special relationship with Russia given their time here in those years after the uh, war. And it's tough for someone in the United States to really understand or address that. But with the rise of China we see today, with Kissinger saying it's rising, the problem with his theory is that the West does not have to decline. It's not some second law of thermodynamics. It's like the jobs that left, it's like the jobs that left the United States. That's not a law of physics. This Austrian economics, right? This, this kind of uh, on rand economics, and excuse me, it's nonsense. Treats people like, just like Marx, units of production and consumption. People are more than that. They build civic society. It's not some law, immutable law of physics that we have to decline. It's not some immutable law of physics that wages can't increase here. The wages in Czech Republic, the reason the car wages, the automotive wages don't go up is China. Okay? You're going to get more and more of that. We don't have, it doesn't have to be like that. That's human agency. Last week, Trump had him on their back heels. As, as much as they say they, they detest Trump, he's a buffoon, he doesn't know what he's doing, well, hey, we've been told for 30 years that the rise of China is nothing you can do about it, and that the only thing you can stop it is, is, is use the treasury system, the Swiss system to get them off the money system, or stop their access to capital markets. And both of those are blunt instruments that destroy the economy of the city of London and Wall Street. Well, guess what? That's dead wrong. All the same geniuses that brought you the meltdown in 2008, the same set of geniuses that shipped all the jobs over to China and made money and said nothing you can do about it. Well, Donald Trump in six months found there are three things you can do about it. Number one, tariffs on a scale and massive that they've never seen before. $50 billion to start, $100 billion to follow, and $100 billion after that, all in 90 days. A quarter of a trillion dollars in tariffs, number one. Number two, a 301. They're ste not stealing. It's forced technology transfer. You have to give them your intellectual property. Silicon Valley has to turn over everything for them to produce. The 301 stop that. Completely stop it, dead in their tracks. In the last, the ZTE thing. There's 30 other companies like ZTE. Bang, 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 bang. That's why China 2025, if you're familiar with China 2025, exists for one reason. The Chinese understand one thing. They have to decouple themselves from the supply chain system in the West, or we have them by the throat. They understand that. They've never moved with urgency in their entire life. They tap us along with a strategic economic dialogue. Let's have another meeting. You know, Hank Paulson, let's have another meeting and talk about it. Well, they rise and we decline. Where President Lee, or Vice Premier Liu, Hey, who's very smart, had a sense of urgency. Get on the plane, and we got to stop this at any cost. In the Wall Street faction, you know, kind of got muddled over the weekend. I think the president will reverse it back. Here as we go. But right now, we're a tributary state. We are Jamestown to their Great Britain. We send them hogs and soybeans and corn and beef Natural gas, Boeing jets, and Apple products. Oh, excuse me. We don't send them Boeing jets and Apple products anymore. They took all that. They make it there, just like they're going to make all your stuff. It's Trump that came up with the, the solution, and they'll eventually execute it on it. But this, you wouldn't know this in the mainstream media. What are they getting on him today? Oh, the, the Korean situation may not... May not happen. You know, it may not happen the 12th. Well, it might not happen the 12th. 
He's got China and, 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 and Korea now so focused on this. And this is the same group mocking and ridiculing him that allowed him to develop 40 or 50 nuclear weapons and ballistic missile technology capability to deliver it. You know, the United States is a great partner. There, there's, there's tremendous cultural bonds that tie us together. Trump would have never said that about the defense of the West if he didn't mean it to the core of his being. And he understands, even more importantly, that the deplorables understand that. That's why we're looking for allies, not looking for protectorates, looking for allies. And by the way, China, Persia, and Turkey. We're going through the dark, we're going to go through a dark valley just like the 1930s. It doesn't have to end like the 1940s ended. It can end it very differently. If we're tough, we have wisdom and resolve, and we hang together. And I think that's what President Trump, the meaning of the Trump presidency. Thank you. Clear words. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Hát, hölgyeim és uraim, nagyon köszönöm, hogy itt voltak, és köszönöm Steve Bannonnak, hogy nem csak elfogadta a meghívásunkat, de el is jött Magyarországra, itt volt. Remélem újabb bizonyítékot szolgáltattunk arra, hogy igazán nagyobb ajándékot nem nagyon lehet adni, mint a gondolat. Ennél nagyobb ajándékot én nem nagyon tudnék most itt hirtelen megnevezni, és mivel egy búcsúnak illik olyan rövidnek lennie, mint egy szerelmi vallomásnak. Viszontlátásra! <gül>